I'll be talking about, um, well, obviously there'll be some amount of um, introductory material, but the new, new work is joint with several co-authors. So there's Mark Gross at Cambridge, Sean Keel at uh, UT Austin, Konsevich at IHS, and Bernd Siebert in Hamburg. So those are um, my collaborators for the joint work. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, there's a notion in commutative algebra and combinatorics called a cluster algebra. Um, so these were originally defined in a very algebraic fashion and uh, by Fermin and Zelovinsky. And later, um, Fock and Goncharov gave a more geometric description of them. But um, right from the outset of the subject, there was a conjecture that a cluster algebra had a canonical basis. So it's some algebra over a field, say, say the complex numbers, and what they were conjecturing is there's some way to give this uh, algebra a, a canonical basis as a, as a complex vector space, so some infinite set, which is a, is a basis of this algebra. And um, they were motivated in part by some examples which they discovered, which they called finite type cluster algebras, where there was a distinguished set of elements called the cluster monomials, which were already a basis. Um, however, there are some more complicated cluster algebras um, where the cluster algebras, where, where these cluster monomials are linearly independent, but they don't span the whole algebra. So they were sort of looking for some additional elements to add to this set to form a basis. <coughs> and sort of one of the reasons they expected this would be true was some work of Lustig. So in representation theory, Lustig had described something called uh, canonical bases for representations of algebraic groups. And so they were partly motivated by that work to introduce the notion of a cluster algebra in the first place. So the idea that there was, should be a canonical basis around was also inspired by this work of Lustig. So the new insight which led uh, us to work on this problem is that this should be regarded as an instance of mirror symmetry. So a cluster algebra um, is the ring of global functions on some variety, a cluster variety, and that variety is, in some sense, a Calabi Yau. And it's not, not a compact Calabi Yau, it's a non compact Calabi Yau. And if you apply mirror symmetry um, to this uh, variety, then this um, canonical basis arises naturally from a construction, a symplectic construction on the mirror. <clears throat> so that's a very rough overview of what I want to talk about. But um, this is at least to motivate what I'll do today, is I'll talk about what is the correct notion of a non-compact calabi yau variety. That's what's called a so-called log calabi yau variety in our context. Um, and how do cluster algebras fit into that framework? So that's what I'm going to talk about today, uh, log calabi yau varieties. So let's have a definition. Um, so what will it be? Well, it'll be a quasi-projective variety U. Um, and it will have the property that's given by, so we take a smooth projective variety X. Let's, let's work over the complex numbers, doesn't it? Um, and I remove a divisor, D. So D will be a, a normal crossing divisor. So locally, it just looks like a union of coordinate hyperplanes in Cn. <clears throat> let's also fix a bit of notation. Let's say the dimension of X is N. Um, and it should have the following property. So kx plus d should be zero. That's the log calabi yau property. Um, and so equivalently, what it means is that we have um, a holomorphic n form, so what's called a holomorphic volume form on u. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So that's just an n-form. The top 
form, which is nowhere zero, um, and it has simple poles along the boundary. So with simple poles along the boundary devices. So here D is a sum of irreducible devices DR. That's the notion of a log Calabia variety. And I'm not going to. Sorry? That's right. That's right. Um, effective, reduced, no, no multiplicities. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> So, um, for various reasons, uh, this is regarded to be the correct notion for correct generalization of Calabi House, this open, non compact setting. Um, so, one uh, reason is uh, related to the Strom and Giao Zaslow conjecture that if you want to have um, uh, this uh, so called special Lagrangian torus vibration on U, uh, it forces the, pole, uh, forces the form to only have simple poles along this boundary divisor. So for various reasons, this seems to be the correct generalization to non-compact setting of calabi varieties. <coughs> um, OK, so a couple more definitions. We'll say it has maximal boundary. Um, if this divisor, D, has a zero strata. Uh, in other words, a point cut out by n branches, analytic branches of D. So in other words, in symbols, a point in D, so locally isomorphic to just the origin in the union of coordinate hyperplanes in CN. And one more definition, we'll say it's positive Um, if this variety U is affine or more or less equivalently um, D supports an ample divisor. So for instance the case that um, uh, Alessio and Al have been talking about if you have a Fano variety um, and you have such a divisor in the anti-canonical uh, linear system, that's an ample divisor. So that this will be a, a positive example. <coughs> yeah, so I say uh, log Calab Yao has maximal boundary if when I look at this boundary divisor, there's a point, so just sort of boundary has a, 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 a zero dimensional strata. Uh, is it clear? <laughs> so D1. Yeah. I'm sorry. Ah, good question. Yes, it's independent of the choice of compactification, actually. So that's not, that's a theorem, but um, yeah, so. That's right, that's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's just give an example. Uh, so, you know, so here's an example. You know, I can take P2 with a smooth elliptic curve. Or I could take P2 with a rational nodal curve. This guy's maximal. <clears throat> Was there another question? Um, it is a property of you. I won't prove it. It's not too hard. Um, Basically, what you have to do is show that this property is invariant under blowing up. So. Well, yeah, I'll probably abuse notation a little bit and talk about U or the pair XD. 
Um, but I will allow, yeah, so it's a, yeah. So um, I'll allow myself to pass between different choices of XD of the same U um, fairly frequently. So I think really one should think about U as the object. <coughs> okay. Uh, or it's roughly equivalent to say that D support, certainly if D supports an ample divisor, then U is affine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the reason I mention this is often that, you know, you'll, how do you construct such a thing? You know, you start with your, your X and you choose your divisor D. So if you happen to know D is an ample divisor, then that's fine. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let's see, ha, let, ha, what about some more examples? More sort of um, general examples. So the first example really should be example zero is that U is just a torus, algebraic torus. So here, um, my holomorphic volume form is just given in coordinates in this way, dz1 over z1, wedge, et cetera, et cetera, wedge dzn over zn, where z1 up to zn are the characters, the coordinates on this torus. And so here, you know, uh, XD, what can I take? Well, any toric X is any uh, smooth projective toric variety. Containing, you know, with, with torus C star to the N. And D is just the, the so-called toric boundary, the complement of the torus. So, you know, if you want to be completely specific, uh, you could take X to be projective space and D to be just the union of the coordinate hyperplanes projective space. So that's somehow the sort of base case, which um, is, is rather easy. Maybe I'll just say immediately, so I said that you know, these varieties, in some generality, tend to have a canonical basis of global functions. So in this case, one can see it immediately. Look at the global functions on this variety. Well, those are just given by the canonical basis, is just given by the characters. So all the monomials. In the coordinate zi. So this is a canonical basis determined up to scale. Um, so why is it canonical? Well, these are just exactly the units in the ring. So that's the characterization of this basis. <clears throat> of course, this isn't a very interesting example, but we'll sort of see in. In more complicated examples, this basis can, can be very, very interesting. <clears throat> okay. So, um, example one. Let's suppose I have a log club, yeah. I want to construct another. Here's one way to do it. So let's pick a subset of co-dimension two. And I want this to be um, contained in a unique component of D. And um, <coughs> so I, I am assuming I want everything to be smooth and normal crossing, so I should say Z is smooth and intersects all the boundary, intersects the remaining components transversely. Then let's blow up Z. So define X tilde D tilde be the blow up of X at Z. 
And d tilde will be the strict transform. I'll write d prime. Strict transform of d. So then, um, check that this is again log club. Yeah, so kx plus d tilde is zero. <coughs> So let's just give the picture at least uh, dimension two at least looks something like this. Here's my XD. I choose, so in dimension two, I'm just choosing a point contained in a unique boundary divisor. I blow up that point. So there'll be an exceptional divisor, E, over the point P, and D tilde is the strict transform of the boundary, so E's not contained in D tilde. And, you know, the higher dimensional case is very similar. <clears throat> That's right. Yeah, so if you do this enough times, you'll lose the positivity property. Yeah, so maybe I should just say, why did I write these two conditions down right at the beginning? So our results will be the strongest under both of these assumptions. So, you know, in case you have maximal boundary and positivity. <clears throat> Questions so far? That's right, yeah, actually that's my next comment. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll refer to this as a, a non-toric blow-up. Yeah, so let me make the following remark. So here, what's happened to the interior, U, so U tilde. So this contains U. So pi, this blow up, it's called pi the blow up, is an isomorphism over U. So just the inverse of pi um, includes U in U tilde. But if we look at the complement, what's that? That's this exceptional divisor E intersected with E tilde. So this is a, a line bundle over Z. <coughs> so we've added something to the interior. Um, and so there's some sort of, you know, in, in, in symplectic geometry, this is some sort of surgery. Some, uh, so it's sometimes called a handle attachment. Uh, in symplectic geometry, it's a Weinstein handle attachment. Sorry? <laughs> well, I had a P1 bundle and I removed like the zero section. Oh, maybe you're right. Okay, maybe I should say uh, an affine. <laughs> so C, <laughs> what do you call that? Um, <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that was that's probably worse than it was, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, yeah. So, uh, just wanted to go back to Sasha's remark. Is of course we could, but also blow up a stratum. Of D of any dimension. and define 
So this will be x tilde goes to x. And then d tilde should be the full inverse image. So we, we, we include the exceptional divisor in d tilde. So then, of course, u tilde hasn't changed. So we regard this as sort of a, um, from our point of view, the most important thing is, um, you know, the interior. So we regard this as some sort of trivial operation that we should be allowed to do um, uh, whenever, we, whenever it's convenient. So this is what we call a toric blow-up. And we'll, we'll do this when it, whenever it's con convenient. Because, as I said, you know, so u is the main thing and, and u is unchanged. <coughs> okay. So, So now if you know a little bit about um, bi-rational geometry of surfaces, here comes the first exercise. So first of all, we say a toric model. Of a local RVL XD is a diagram. Start with RXD. We do a sequence of toric blow-ups, let's call that x tilde d tilde. <laughs> and then we do some uh, non-toric blow-downs. In other words, we have some x bar d bar and some non-toric blow-ups here, a sequence of non-toric blow-ups. Uh, such that this eventual variety, x bar d bar, is a toric pair. So, toric variety with its toric boundary. Oh, you can imagine there's some kind of roofs. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be honest, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, it, no, it's not a silly question. <laughs> I mean, so this is a big theorem uh, if you just ignore the boundary by, um, who is it, Vlodacek, and, you know, that if you have any birational transformation between smooth projective varieties, it can be factored into a sequence of blow-ups and blow-down. That is a theorem, I think. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but, you know, what, all I'm saying is that's a non-trivial theorem, and I haven't even thought about whether that's sufficient to, yeah. But let's, uh, I mean, so this is some, some kind of definition which may or may not be correct. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry? Yes, right, right. So I, I'm, as I said, maybe this needs slightly modifying, but this is the essence of it. Um, and then the lemma I want to mention, just to give you some idea, is that if we're in dimension two, Uh, with maximal boundary, uh, then there is a toric model. And so, of course, in dimension two, birational geometry is very explicit. Any birational map can be factored into a sequence of blow-ups and blow-downs of points. That's a very classical result. Using that, it's not hard to prove this lemma. Um, well, how to say, so one can always blow up the bound, you know, do toric blow-ups on the boundary. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so, no, there's no uniqueness. Right, that's a good point. Yeah, so, so, um, so this is highly non-unique in general.
Um, yes, yeah, so sorry, thanks for the comment. Let me just give an example. Um, so, for instance, uh, um, yeah, so maybe the best example would be something like this. Um, if I just take, uh, let's say, I take P2 of an elliptic curve. Oh, actually, no, I don't want to do that. Um, an irrational node will occur. And I blow up a bunch of points here. Then it's sort of a classical fact that you know, I'll get some minus one curves lying over these uh, points. And so that's, that is an instance of a toric model. But there'll be lots and lots of minus one curves on XD that have absolutely nothing to do with the original exceptional curves. So there'll be all sorts of different ways of blowing this down to P2. Um, so, you know, so for instance, as everybody's aware, you know, if I have a cubic surface, that's obtained from P2 by blowing up six points. But there are 27 minus one curves on the cubic surface, there are many sets of six curves inside that 27 that, that you can choose as the exceptional curves of a blow down to P2. And so, I mean, that's an example, uh, very classical example, you know, which sort of, if you sort of study that, it's related to the Valgruf V6 and so on and so forth. So somehow, the point is that there can be many, many different toric models, and, and it's, it's a choice to choose one. <coughs> Yes, sorry. Uh, I, I wanted to take a rational nodal curve here. Yes, sorry. Um, the point is... Um, oh, sorry, sorry. So, <laughs> that's not a Doric model. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so let me call it D bar or something. And I'm sorry, that was my fault. Yeah, so, so, so blow up a bunch of points here. I'm sorry, this is supposed to be a, an example of a toric model. What I'm saying is it's not unique because there are lots of minus one curves here which can be blown down instead. Yeah, F thanks for the correction. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so let's just do a quick example. Um, so here's something where, um, you know, the, the toric model is not completely obvious, but it's not hard if you think about it. Okay, so for well, this picture, actually maybe I'll slightly license here. Um, yeah, I mean actually I'm, I'm always going to assume that D is non-empty. Yeah, um, but another example would be something like P2 of an elliptic curve. So somehow that's never going to have a toric model because you can't get rid of the elliptic curve by blowing down. Um, well, what I'm saying is that you know, if you have this toric model picture, there's going to be a relation between the two boundary divisors. They're going to differ from each other by a bunch of P1s. So, yeah. Okay, so this is a, an example of a toric model. So he, I, I'll, I'll label... The, the self-intersection numbers of the curve, so I've got a conic and a line in P2. So where's the toric model for this surface? <clears throat> um, well, let me describe it in the following way. So first I'm going to blow up this point here, one of the intersection points, doesn't matter which one. Um, and now I want to blow up this point here, Q. Now, this looks suspiciously like um, the uh, surface F2. So, in fact, there is a minus one curve like this, and that can be contracted to the toric surface F2 with its toric boundary. So, this is the F2, it's just a 
rational ruled surface with a negative section of self-intersection minus two. <clears throat> and so where did this curve E come from? So if you sort of trace it back, uh, what it was, if you take the tangent line, uh, so the conic at the point Q, that's what this curve is. It's the strict transform. of that uh, line. So after one blow up, that line is here. After one more, it's, it's meeting the boundary at a, a smooth point. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I'm just drawing the self-intersection of the curves. So it's the, yeah. It's just the convenient way to keep track. Of, yes, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> okay, and so here's my exercise. Um, exercise one, uh, find a toric model for um, P2 with a rational nodal curve. Rational nodal cubic. And let's just one more exercise. It's you no know, by rational geometry of smooth surfaces. It's fairly easy, but uh, this is the case. So show that if D is smooth, um, x, x D log C Y2, uh, then there does not exist a toric model. Incidentally, perhaps I should have said, uh, it's easy, but let me point it out. Note, by the adjunction formula, Um, for x d uh, log c y two, uh, you know, k d zero. Uh, in other words, um, the arithmetic genus of the curve d one, <coughs> and so d is either. So it's either smooth elliptic, rational nodal, or, or a or a chain of uh, oh, a wheel of p1s, a cycle of p1s. So we're assuming, remember, it's nodal, so we don't, we don't allow, uh, for instance, a cusp. <clears throat> okay. So let's also um, give a sort of negative example in this direction. Maybe I'll go over here, actually. So let's have a log a CY3, um, which is irrational. So certainly if it's irrational, so it's not birational um, to P3, then it certainly doesn't have a toric model. So if you know a little bit about Fano freefolds, this isn't hard. Uh, 
I'm sorry? Uh, it's just by definition, I assume that D is a normal crossing divisor. Yeah, I, I yeah, so, yeah. I, by assumption. And you know, you might say, oh, well, why, why don't you consider the cusp? So in fact, if I had a cuspidal curve and I, I, I tried to resolve the boundary to normal crossings, then I, the boundary um, would, uh, if, I, if it stays anti-canonical, I would have to have a curve of higher multiplicity. Uh, in the, in, so there would be, a, there'd be a, a curve in the boundary where the, the, the volume form has a pole of higher order. And so that's kind of out of this realm where we, we understand how to do mirror symmetry. <coughs> yeah, sorry, I meant to add one thing. So this is with maximal boundary. Um, necessary condition for a Torg model. Um, so I'm saying that this is necessary to have a Torg model. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is, oh, oh sorry. Let me let me just uh, <laughs> continue. Yeah. If I did say it, I didn't mean to say it. I'm saying. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no. 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 Because. Um, Yeah, I'm not, I'm not claiming any kind of if and only if here. I'm just saying that certainly a necessary condition, both these things are condition, uh, so both of these things are necessary to have a toric model. First of all, your variety should be rational, and secondly, the boundary should be maximal. So I'm just saying, of course, in dimension three, we know a lot about Fano manifolds. There are some examples of irrational Fanos. So for instance, I can take X be a smooth quartic in P, in P4, So that's irrational, according to Iskowski and Manin. But I still need to cook up um, a maximal boundary divisor. So what's my D going to be? Well, it's a hyperplane section, so it's, so it's in the anti-canonical linear system. It's just O1. There's a hyperplane section. Um, okay, so this presents a problem. How are we going to make it have a zero stratum? Well, in fact, what we'll do is make a singular example here that can be resolved. <coughs> so what I'll do is take um, a D to be singular. Uh, with what's called a cusp singularity. Um, so let's be specific about this. So for, for instance, is uh, my cortic, just an example, And D will be U equals zero. And the singularity, so the cusp singularity of P in D. So uh, I'm setting U equals zero. And let's look in the affine piece where T is non-zero. So then this becomes zero in X to the four plus Y to the four plus Z to the four. X, Y, Z, zero inside C3. So that has minimal resolution. Uh, 
a cycle of P1s. That's, what, that's an example of a so-called cusp singularity. Okay, and so now what you can do is take this pair, XD, and do some blow-up, so resolve, to get this guy with maximal boundary. Yeah, so the picture is, you know, in, in, um, in X itself, so X is smooth, but this guy has some kind of nasty singularity. Uh, but when you blow up, you do just one blow up, you get this picture where you have two divisors that meet like this, along this. Um, got two divisors meeting along this triangle of, of P1s, and if you sort of do a couple more blow-ups, you get to this guy X tilde D tilde. <clears throat> you can kind of see, I mean, this isn't quite normal crossing, but here's, these guys are going to become zero strata here. <clears throat> yeah, so it's not too hard to produce examples which you absolutely cannot have a toric model. <clears throat> Um, something similar will work, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think basically the same thing will work, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me just make this remark that roughly speaking, um, a toric model, or the existence of a toric model, is the same as having a, a torus full dimensional torus inside U. So certainly if I have a toric model, I get this torus, right, so if I have, you know, x goes to x tilde goes to x bar, I've got the torus in here, and, you know, that, that lifts to here, so we, you know, the, this uh, map is an isomorphism over the torus, and so I get my torus in x. Um, so certainly this direction is obvious. Um, the other direction, well, this is sort of related to the discussion we had earlier. You know, what do we know about birational geometry in higher dimensions? So you probably need some sort of minimal model program, and you need to think about singularities, etc. But something like this is, is uh, morally true. <coughs> Okay, so now I can tell you what a cluster variety is. <clears throat> so two conditions. So the, the, the second one we've already discussed at length. the variety. Is a log clavial u uh, such that, so first of all, there's um, a two-form. So sigma is going to be a non-degenerate holomorphic two-form on u.
um, with log poles along the boundary divisor. Um, again, so I'm writing u is x set minus d. <coughs> and again, this, this condition will be independent of d. That's basically due to Deline. Um, so what does it mean to have log poles? So I've got this um, sheaf on x of um, holomorphic forms with Holomorphic one forms with log poles along D. So this is just locally generated by So yeah, so at a point P, so here I'm saying that P in D in X, where D has R branches, <coughs> so I'm allowed to have D log of ZI for, for I in a, for, for I corresponding to a component of D and have the, re the regular a DZJ for the other J. <clears throat> so then my, um, my sigma should be in a global section of this wedge two of the sheet. So it can locally be expressed in terms of these differential forms at a point P. Uh, and secondly, there should be a Turing model. <clears throat> okay, so this condition one, uh, you should think of as some um, non-compact analog of a holomorphic symplectic or hyperkähler variety. So I like to call this log holomorphic symplectic. Um, and so, of course, the immediate example is that in dimension two, this is nothing new. So, in dimension two, a cluster, well, the first condition is vacuous because you can just take sigma to be equal to omega. So, n is equal to two. And so cluster is the same as the existatoric model, uh, which, as we just saw, is the same as maximal bound. <coughs> but this is um, a non-trivial condition in higher dimensions, the same as in the, in the compact case. <coughs> Yes. It wouldn't be, because uh, if you have maximal boundary, the boundary is certainly not empty, you see. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so, um, no, it does not, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, um, there's a little lemma um, which um, really clarifies this first condition. So, um, so what does it mean to, uh, to have a toric model? So the blow-ups toric model 
are very constrained, And toric model, you know, for cluster variety. So remember, we've got some picture like this, x bar, do some blow ups, and this is a toric variety. <coughs> um, And so what I, I eventually want to get a, a form on X or equivalently on X tilde, sigma. Um, but of course that will define a form sigma bar on X bar because um, you know, outside co-dimension two, I can just take it to be sigma and then this will extend over co-dimension two by the usual sort of Hartog's property. So if this is, if I have a form here, I'll certainly have a form sigma bar on X bar. <coughs> But now we know this is a toric variety. <coughs> so what it follows is that sigma bar is actually has constant coefficients. Um, so this is just given by a skew matrix. So this is a non-degenerate skew matrix. Um, yes. Yeah, so I want this to be uh, have log forms along the bound uh, log poles along the boundary. That's right. Um, so, it, it, uh, yeah, so what I was trying to explain just then, I mean, maybe it wasn't clear, let me say it again, you know, if I have the form on X or equivalently X tilde, um, I can get the form on X bar um, automatically because, you know, after all, I can just remove a co-dimension two subset of X bar, then that will be an open subset of X tilde, I can just restrict the form. No, 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 it's okay, yeah. And what I'm saying is, so, you know, so this is, this is a bunch of blow-ups. So there's an open subset in here, let's call it maybe, I don't know, V, which maps isomorphically, and this is complement is co-dimension two. Yeah, so I have the form on V, it will automatically extend to, just by this Hartog's property. So what I'm saying is if I have sigma up here, I certainly have this guy down here. Okay, um, but the, the why is that a good thing? Is because on the on the torus, we know that you know this this. Um, let me just write it down. You know, if I take this log forms on the torus, that's just a free module. You know, it's it's, it's a trivial sheaf. So it means that when you take global sections, you're just going to have a, a skew matrix. So this form just becomes a, becomes a matrix. <coughs> okay, so now what's the condition? So now I, I say, okay, now start with this form and start blowing up. What's the condition that this form lifts? That's a non-trivial condition. All right, so let me tell you what it is. Oops, where are my notes? <coughs> So what's the condition? So I must blow up. Uh, the following type of um, center. So it's a co-dimension two center. So C will be Z, the center, will be the intersection of some component, the boundary, with um, the hypersurface given by a character of the torus. So let me write this down and explain. So here, where? So what's C? So C inside D is a component of the boundary. 
chi is a character of the torus, so you know this is just a monomial character of the torus. Um, lambda is just some scalar, some non-zero scalar, and chi is determined by. following condition. So I have this form sigma bar. I've got a divisor. I can take its residue along that divisor. So now I'll get a log one form on the boundary divisor. That should be equal to um, d log chi up to a scalar. So roughly speaking, what I'm saying is, yeah, if you take the two form on, on the toric variety, you restrict the boundary divisor to take its residue, you'll get a one form. So that defines some kind of um, foliation of that boundary divisor. You must blow up um, a hypersurface um, contained in that um, foliation. Uh, sorry. Um, this is just a, a scalar, yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> that's the condition. <laughs> uh. Sorry. Uh. There's no condition on lambda. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing, remember, you have to remember that we're in this sort of situation. We're on a torus. This form is constant coefficients. So, you know, so I know that when I restrict to this boundary divisor, I'm going to get something with constant coefficients. So, That's right, yeah. That's right, exactly. There is some rationality involved. Yeah, exactly. So somehow, a priori, when you restrict this, you just get a one form with arbitrary complex coefficients. But I'm saying up to a scalar, you know, those have to be multiples of, of, a, of a rational vector. Yeah. Did you see what I'm saying? There, there is a non-trivial condition here. If this, if this divisor, if this, um, when you restrict, if you get something which is a, a, a tuple which is not a scalar multiple of a rational vector, then you cannot blow up. That, you know, there's no, no character. It's somehow, if you think about it in terms of fo foliation or something, that doesn't close up and you don't get algebraic manifolds. So there's a non-trivial condition hiding here. You know, if, if this guy is not rational, then you won't be able to do any blurb at all. <coughs> um, and so what I want to, I mean, I, I'm out of time, but let me just say, so what's the picture? You know, so the picture, of course, is changing coordinates. Uh, you know, without loss of generality, let's say that, you know, this component is given by uh, z1 equals zero, and this chi is given by, say, z2. <clears throat> so then what are we doing? So up to what we get is just the dimension two picture cross a trivial direction. So remember, dimension two is just this simple thing. You've got a, a toric boundary divisor. You select a point, and you just blow up that point. And so what we're saying is that in the cluster picture, if you just look at a single blow up, it's just exactly this um, dimension two picture across a trivial direction. Um, of course, that's locally, so for a single blow-up, but globally, of course, when you look at this toric variety, I sort of like to draw this picture. Here's a picture of your toric variety of its toric boundary. What you'll have is that these guys 
that you blow up, there'll be now hypersurfaces in the boundary divisors, but they won't line up. So it won't be globally a product, but it will be locally along this stratum a product. <coughs> so that's kind of the, the condition that comes out of this uh, log holomorphic symplectic condition under the assumption that you have a toric model. So what I've presented here is a sort of algebraic geometer's version of what the guys in cluster algebras were doing to begin with. So they had, you know, they, in their combinatorial description, they had this skew matrix. And then there was, um, I'll describe more next time, there was this process of mutation and the notion of seeds and so on. Um, but somehow, this is the interpretation in algebraic geometry of the combinatorial data that goes into the uh, cluster algebra. So this skew matrix corresponds to defining a uh, holomorphic two-form on your log Calabi L variety. <clears throat> okay, so I should stop here, but I'll continue in this vein tomorrow. Um, actually, this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, so thanks. <laughs>